IBM turned down three great opportunities at the end of the last century. Uh, uh, one was the opportunity to produce the personal computer. IBM told Stephen Jobs and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, Steve Jobs and his, his colleague Wozniak that uh, they didn't think that there was any interest in a personal computer, there was any demand. So somehow they turned, they didn't think it was valuable. So in a way it hit this, what I call the knowledge filter. They had that opportunity they didn't want. They turned down the opportunity to buy Microsoft back about 1984-85 for something like 30, 35 million dollars. A famous memo from a vice president at IBM wrote, neither Gates nor any of his 30 accomplices have the qualifications to work for IBM. And you know, now it seems kind of like a stupid thing to say in retrospect. But it actually, I mean, I was around it. It made sense. At that time, IBM hired graduates from MIT, um, California Institute of Technology, and one other place I forget. Why would they hire a college dropout like Bill Gates? I mean, he dropped out of Harvard, but still. Um, uh, and the other 30 accomplices, uh, who knows? So they turned down this opportunity that would ultimately be Microsoft for almost nothing, um, uh, uh, relatively, because they couldn't see the value of the idea. And the third thing they turned down, which is just um, interesting, was the uh, semiconductor. They, one of their own engineers, scientist Ted Hoff, developed the microprocessor, which is key to the semiconductor. He went to his boss, his boss's boss at IBM, and they said, yeah, you know, we don't make semiconductors, we're not interested in this. He went to, 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 to join forces with Gordon Moore, together they started Intel, and the rest is history. Well, right there is an example, you see, you see, okay, here's all these investments in knowledge that's creating ideas that are valuable, and yet here are decision makers at IBM, a private company, say, no, we don't think they're valuable. In all of these cases, what got the ideas out to create jobs, growth, competitiveness. It wasn't the companies, existing companies, it was the willingness of people to say, I think it's a good idea, and act on it. That's the essence of, of entrepreneurship. In, in Germany, uh, uh, there's a good example, again involving IBM. There were three young men working for IBM uh, a few years ago. They had the idea that what IBM should, could make is better, is business software. So they went to the boss, the boss's boss. They said, nah, we don't think this is a good idea. The three young men thought, they, they believed in their dream, they believed in their vision, this is what they wanted to do. They couldn't do it at IBM. So they thought, oh, they'll start their own business. So they went to the three main banks of Germany, the Deutsche Bank, the Dresdner Bank, the Commerzbank. They said, will you fund us to start this business? And the bank said, you know, it looks like a great idea, but if we're any good, IBM would be doing it. So that didn't work. Fortunately, one of them had a family relationship with a bank, a regional local bank near Heidelberg. They started SAP, and the rest is history. But notice, if they'd been unable to start SAP for whatever reason, because it was too difficult, policy made it too difficult, um, there were barriers, uh, uh, that would have meant that uh, uh, certainly the, the Baden-Württemberg wouldn't have SAP there, uh, Germany wouldn't, and Europe wouldn't have SAP there. This generated a lot of growth, jobs, competitiveness, uh, uh, a good, it's given people what they want. So that entrepreneurship, the reason why in the, in the book, in, in research, we argue entrepreneurship has emerged as a driving force in a globalized economy. It's the mechanism that takes those investments in knowledge that society makes in terms of education, education at all levels, but certainly at, at, at gymnasium or higher levels, certainly at the university, investments that society makes in terms of culture, research. People have a lot of ideas, they have a lot of creativity. But those ideas, what's good, which way should we go, which ideas should be pursued, they're always contested. That's the difference between ideas or knowledge and the traditional factor of plants and factories. When you have, a, 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 when you have something physical, a machine, you know what that machine can typically do. If it's a wood cutter, it cuts wood. Um, <clears throat> if it's a textile machine, it makes clothing. But if you have an idea 
about a new kind of service, a new kind of software, a new kind of, if it's a new idea, nobody's ever really sure, is it a good idea or is it, it isn't. It takes people who are willing to act on those ideas, just as the uh, example in SAP um, uh, did. So places started to, places, meaning cities, regions, started to look around. I think in Europe, in Germany, uh, they started to realize, when they looked to Silicon Valley and in, uh, near San Francisco, I mean, that's pretty intimidating. That seems bigger than life, just these high-tech entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs and, and uh, Apple Computer. Uh, but when they started to look to other places that were doing pretty well, like around Munich, like around um, uh, the Rotterdam, Amsterdam area they call Ronstadt, uh, was making this kind of shift. Austin, Texas. Uh, North Carolina, there's a famous research triangle. I think, I think policymakers start to realize, you know, if they can do this in Texas, if they can do this in, in North Carolina, we can surely do this in our place. And so that public policy start to shift away from an orientation that a generation earlier had been about. How do we create a society where people go into factories and they turn out cars and autos, and that's going to create our future, to a society where people are going to be, have the, 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 the human capital, the knowledge, the intellectual, also the emotional capabilities to deal with a world where they've got to discover opportunities, and then they've got to act on them. And that's what I mean by, in the book, that's why we, I call the book, The Entrepreneurial Society. Because this seems to be, this is not a, um, uh, uh, a calling out that places should create the entrepreneurial society. Places are already trying to do this. It's an interpretation. Why are policymakers trying to make their places, their cities, their regions, their countries entrepreneurial?